Hi, this video is about use requirements in the US and in Europe. So I'm joined by Eric Pelton, who is a partner with Eric Pelton and Associates in Falls Church, Virginia, uh, just outside Washington DC. And we are talking about the use requirements in the US as compared to Europe. So thank you for being on the video. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. And we're in sunny Orlando, Florida, where we just wrapped <laughs> up the INTA annual conference and had a great time. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> So uh, in Germany or in Europe, we can uh, use trademarks. Um, we only have to use trademarks five years after registration and we can get trademarks just registered without any use. Um, and actually trademarks will not really like fall from the register. If you don't use the trademarks, uh, they can just not easily be enforced. And the situation in the US is very different. Tell us more. Right, in the US generally, you must have use to complete the registration process. You can file an application based on an intent to use or of course actual use if you're already using it. But even when you file based on intent to use, you eventually need to show during the course of the application process that you have used the mark in commerce with all of the goods and services in order to get approved and complete the registration. Uh, but applicants in the U.S. do have a considerable amount of time to show that use because once the application has been approved initially and published in the public record, you can then take up to three years to create that use and to demonstrate it. Right. That is very different from Europe. In Europe, the situation is the way that you can file for an application or even in Germany and then the registration, uh, the, the then the application would be registered at some point and then you can just enforce the trademark even without using the trademark. Um, you can have a trademark registered and go after infringers for at least five years because five years after the registration the defendant in any case can uh, attack the trademark for not being used for the registered goods and services but that's something that has to be done by third parties so you don't have to actively prove use to the office. So it's very different and that leads to some complications and some really strange problems. Um, some of the larger applicants especially, they file the same trademark, for example the Telecommunications um, Corporation Orange. Uh, they are filing the trademark Orange um, every four or five years for a number of goods right. and services that they are never intend to use really. And then they enforce their trademark uh, against others that are using <laughs> these very different uh, goods and services. Um, and that can be um, sometimes considered fraudulent, but actually the courts uh, sided with the applicants. There was a recent decision um, by, uh, for the uh, fountain pen manufacturer Pelican at the European Court of Justice, where they filed the nearly exactly same logo for their, um, for their logo, um, also for things like travel services or something like this. Um, and they enforced this trademark for um, services that they were not really using. Um, and then the um, defendant um, tried to cancel the trademark, but the trademark was not cancelled because the European Court of Justice in the final instance said, well, um, the logo changed a little bit over the years and it was completely um, non-fraudulent basically mm. to um, re-register the trademark every couple of years for even very different goods and services and enforce it. So uh, that was a little bit surprising to many um, and very different from the US. That would not happen in right. the US, right? Right. This is very different in the US where our uh, entire system of rights is basically based on use. And even if you don't have a registration in the US, but you have been using the trademark in commerce, you have rights, what priority common law rights that you could enforce against somebody who either tries to register the same, you know, similar mark for similar goods and services or attempts to use the same mark for similar goods and services. And this does create a lot of confusion between uh, clients that expand abroad and then notice that somebody may have registered something uh, in another country in Europe, for example, and may not be using it, but the fact that they have that registration 
you know, obviously is problematic because they have rights that they are likely able to enforce. And it also creates some confusion for uh, businesses from Europe coming to do business in the United States or wanting to file to protect in the United States right. uh, without use. So this is a, a good dialogue to understand better about these differences. And the U.S. is one of the few systems in the world, I believe, that is based on use. It's more common. Most countries are based on um, similar principles to the European ones. Yes, and uh, but I actually uh, sympathize with the U.S. system <laughs> because then um, these fraudulent strategies uh, would not really exist. Um, so what kind of use is required in the U.S.? Uh, my understanding is that um, trademarks were canceled in the past for, um, for fraud when, they were, when the applicant did not really show uh, use for different goods and services of the mark and then the whole mark was, um, was canceled basically. But uh, the, the case law changed a little bit, right? with regard to fraud. So it has evolved a little bit and uh, now the main concern is which products or services are you using if you're not using them with all of those in the registration. So you can either delete some from the registration proactively or when you go to renew it, if you're no longer or never were using it with some of the goods and services, because you have to sign a declaration regarding use, um, you should delete those items that are no longer in use. The types of use in the United States that um, satisfy the requirements, generally there have to be sales. And for services, generally advertising is sufficient to show the use. So it could be a poster or a web page is you know, the most common these days, the easiest type of marketing. For products, it's a little bit more complicated. For products, the best types of uses are on the products themselves or on the labels or the tags that are affixed or attached to the products. Where it gets more complicated is when you have a product but then trademark or the logo may not be on the product itself but it may be on a sign advertising it or on a web page advertising it. The Patent and Trademark Office generally does not accept that type of use because it is not on the product itself. There have been some discussions about possibly expanding what type of use is acceptable but for now that's, it, ne it needs to really be on the product or the label or uh, the packaging or the instruction manual unless it's a very um, particular type of industry. Like for example, I had a client once that made cement and because cement comes out in a liquid form all the time, there's never going to be a trademark on the cement. So in that type of instance, the trademark on the truck that delivers the cement or on the sales information that they provide to their customers. In that type of situation, that type of use would be acceptable. Yes, and my understanding is um, that the USPTO also really loves packaging for <laughs> as a proof of use, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, my understanding is that um, you only have to show use for one good or service in each class. Is that correct? That's correct. You only have to um, provide them with a sample of the, of the type of use for one item or service in each class. Although you are the registrant or the applicant is signing a declaration stating that they are using it with all of those other things. And there are talks um, un underway about changing the system a little bit to help better ensure that all of the goods and services are actually being used so that uh, we don't end up with registrations that are overly broad and make it harder for applicants to clear marks or to resolve disputes and figure out exactly what the mark is being used for since our system is based so much on the use. Um, so if you are not using it for all goods in a certain class, let's say 28, there is like games and toys, but also like sporting goods. If you are a sporting good company, but you also have the um, goods like um, toys um, registered in that class, um, to leave the toys in the class, would that be fraudulent? Would you be, lose, would you be losing the whole, the whole class or just the goods that are not used? So. It depends on the intent as to whether it's fraudulent, and that's why it's very difficult to show fraud. Um, and generally, if there is, let's call it an error or an oversight in how overbroad the description is, generally they, the, the courts or the trademark office will correct it by deleting the ones that are inappropriate, but it will not invalidate the entire registration. 
That's not to say that it's not possible to invalidate the entire register, but it's very, very rare. Okay. Good to hear that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, that was a really interesting um, discussion about uh, use and that will certainly help my clients uh, to understand better the requirements in the US. Uh, thank you for being on my video. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>